This is a tale that could happen only in the city of New York and happen only among its people of the theater to whom a press notice is a coat of arms. I am, in my luckier hours, one of that chameleon tribe of the backstages, Alfred O'Shea by name, a playwright successful enough to receive the bow of an occasional head waiter. This is the truth, edited and twisted about a bit, but for the first time told of the glamorous Marcia Tilliou, whose husband I once had the troublesome honor of being. With a screech of police sirens and a spate of newspaper headlines crying murder, this is how the tale of Marcia Tilliou ended. Here are two men from the police. My daughter has been murdered. Marcia Tilliou was dead. Who found the body? I... I came to call on her this morning, to breakfast together. She's not awake, the maid said. I looked in. No, not awake. Asleep forever. Look. A heart torn with a murderous bullet. My Marcia. My radiant child. And this is the happy night on which the tale of Marcia Tilliou began. Greatest opening night in years, and it was all yours. Well, I had a slight assist from the playwright, my dear. <laughs> oh, it was the most beautiful performance I've ever seen. How sweet of you to say so. A great job, Marcia. You kill the people. Oh, thank you, dearest George. Thank you for an unforgettable performance, my dear. Oh, Otto, how nice of you. The forgotten lady will be remembered forever. <laughs> they just loved you, Marcia. You're very sweet, my dear. After tonight, you're a star, Marcia. A star that will shine forever. Not unless I get some sleep. <laughs> Thank you all for your flowers, the applause, and your kind words. Let's hope the critics are 2% as generous. But very likely, we'll all wake up to a massacre. <laughs> Good night. There'll be no massacre, darling. The critics staggered into the night, muttering hosannas. It was superb. Your play, Alfie. Champagne and firecrackers. You are a great writer, darling. I'll make an even better husband, darling. I doubt that. A good husband has to have a talent for silence. <laughs> That's what makes the male dependable. His inability to talk. And you, darling, are a man of words. But such lovely words. I haven't a word. I just worship you. Promise you'll never break my heart. I'd always hold it this side up. Miss Hillier's dressing. No more visitors, please. Who is it, Tommy? Only your shadowy father, my dear. Come out of his limo to pay homage to his daughter, she did. I thought you were in Connecticut, teaching those young things to act. Oh, I'm awful. I was going to write you. But it wasn't necessary. The press columns kept me informed. May I come in? Darling. <laughs> My dear, you were like an army with banners. In all my years as an actor, I've never beheld so glamorous a talent as yours. You saw me? Why, you old pollywog, I had no idea you were out front. My dear, a hundred Cyranos with drawn swords couldn't have kept me out of your theater tonight. My daughter's debut as a star. <laughs> nice, wasn't it? Mm. My father, Maurice Tilliou, Alfred O'Shea. How do you do, sir? Mr. O'Shea is the scoundrel I've chosen for my husband. Oh. Get acquainted, you two. Well, my congratulations to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Alfred, your lovely present. They're adorable. They're like me. Make-believe wings. <laughs> Sit down, Dad, and please don't start bragging. Turn him off, Alfred, if he gets on Hamlet. My dear daughter, were I a hundred Barrymores instead of one miserable Tilliou, I could talk only of you tonight and your triumph. You've written a very fine play, Mr. O'Shea. But it was my daughter's genius that made it glow, that brought the audience to its feet. I quite agree. I remember a similar phenomenon on my opening night as Othello. You could hear the cheering far out into the street. 
sweet daddy. I learned as a child to call him Old Davil Ham. <laughs> so you liked me tonight, Mr. Tiller you. Your little crack-brained daughter did not bring disgrace on the great name she bears. You mock me, daughter. Oh, darling, forgive me. And rightly. I have, for 20 years, haunted the back rows. Theatrical has been. No manager, however lowly or desperate, would engage me. I hovered around Broadway like a ghost. Shabby, garrulous, invisible. But I had one bit of glory left. My child. I remember one sorry day when I returned to my hotel and I saw my little girl at the piano, sir, mastering the complicated coordinations of a Bach minuet. You were seven, Marcia. <laughs> Those little hands. And I said to her mother, I've been turned down again, my dear, but it doesn't matter. For one day, my name will belong to a star. And now it does, as I always dreamed it would, my youth. Marcia Tilly became one of the quick and glittering legends of Broadway. A name with a light on it, a name to gavel and write about. Our marriage was ideal. And then, our marriage was a bust. She began driving me potty with her infidelities. She was in love, out of love, half ice solder, half pirate. Scandals bounced off her like rain off a duck. For nothing matters when the applause is loud and the years are all skyrockets going up. What's this ugly tale I hear about your new play, Alfred? We're closing on the road, not bringing it in. Oh, I'm surprised. Marsha tells me it's very clever. Yes, I'm down to wifely applause. It seems I'm the youngest ex-genius Broadway has seen since Soroyan. Can I buy you a drink, Laxley? No, thanks. The Critics Circle forbids its membership to drink with embittered playwrights. It's too hazardous. Here are the receipts. 25 standees. Standees. <laughs> Beautiful word. Oh, you're a critic of the drama, sir, and uh, I speak to you with the deference of an old actor who never quite commanded the praise of critics. But who, though wounded by their thousand arrows, still holds them in the highest esteem. Your last article about my daughter was the first to do her justice, Mr. Laxley. I wrote that piece during a total eclipse of the intellect, and I regret every syllable of it. Your daughter, sir, is an ingrate with the soul of a baboon. A great actress may be permitted an oddity or two. No. Your article was accurate. There have been great actresses in the past. I can remember many of them. But none like my daughter, Marcia. She doesn't speak lines. She radiates them. I've seen every one of her performances for three years. You hear that? Her entrance never misses. She comes on the stage like magic. I would admire your daughter a bit more than I do if you could induce her to wear a gag off stage. Well, I'm sure she never meant any offense to you. No, not at all. Childish high spirits. I have a brain made out of laundry soap. When I write, I give off soap bubbles. My mm. face looks like an oyster. I'm as appealing as an old sock hanging on a gas jet this about a man who has adored her brilliantly for two years. And my dear Laxley, we must remember she's young. She's not young. She's older than the original serpent. <laughs> my dear Philip. Her dinner scene, I we must miss it. not to shed a tear. Tears are quite out of style for women of my sort. I should as soon think of going round in knee-length bloomers. Instead, when I remember you, I'll always order another highball and drown you over and over in three inches of alcohol. Goodbye, Phil. Don't swim too long.
Marsha here yet? No. Late, huh? Eh? As usual. They're rehearsing. Well, she'd be along any minute, sir. Hmm. I'm in a hurry. Uh, may I give her a message for you? Yes. Tell her I've left her, if you don't mind. Well, isn't that something you should tell her yourself, sir? Briefly, no. Tell her I'm taking a boat. Well, may I say where you're going? I'm still a bit undecided. Possibly I shall shoot lions, or wrestle with alligators, or I may merely live in a cave for the rest of my life. Anything will seem quite pleasant after three years beside your daughter. Well, you'll remember your years with Marcia as the golden time of your life, sir. My dear father-in-law, do forgive me. Mm. I'm sure the blame is all mine. I'm just not quite bright enough to see it. I see only Battle of Gettysburg. Frightful carnage. Love is etc. Marriage is etc. etc. In short, I haven't drawn an unhysterical breath since our honeymoon breakfast. You mean you haven't drawn a sober one? Exit. One drunkard. He didn't wait for her. She'll not mind. He's been living off her for two years, throwing away her money. She has a right to try to find happiness where she can. I'm late. Herbie wants everyone in costume. Idiotic bore, these dress parades, and I'm beginning to suspect that Mr. Herbert is a bore, too. Martinet, my act one costume here? Just arrived. Well, flex your muscles and get me into it. So, uh, Alfred was here. Yes? He asked me to tell you that he's left you. Did it sound permanent? Well, he was an ungrateful pup. He said something about uh, taking a boat for some place. Our goodbye scenes have not included sea voyages. This one sounds a little more sincere. It's a rotten thing to do, leaving you doing rehearsals for a new play. Oh, it was my fault. I won all the arguments. There's nothing left for him to do. Let's look on the bright side. One pair of lungs less to scream at me. Did he... Did he sound as if he hated me? Did he mention anyone? People usually not, madam. Do you know who I am, Miss Tillyhew? Putting two and two together, I'd say that you were Mrs. Frederick Herbert. It's not that easy, Marcia Tillio. What isn't, my dear? Stealing another woman's husband. It isn't all sitting in gaudy restaurants listening to his lying compliments, accepting his diamonds. It's not going to be that easy. <laughs> Get her a handkerchief, Tommy. A big one. I'm so glad you didn't shoot me, Mrs. Herbert. I'd have felt terribly silly dying over Mr. Herbert. Like being shot for stealing milk bottles. I've had enough of fools clawing at me. Snatching at me as if I were a Christmas tree. This foul dress doesn't fit. Nothing fits. Miss Tilly is almost ready, Mr. Herbert. You're keeping the entire cast waiting, Marcia. Terribly sorry, Mr. Herbert. I was delayed a few minutes chatting with your wife. Would you mind taking her along with you? Minus her shooting iron. You may keep the gun, Father. It's mine. My trophy. I'm sorry this happened, Marcia. It won't happen again. The 
you'll have to wait a few minutes. They can all wait. Like Alfred didn't. Listen, Mr. Tiller, you. There'll be no outburst from the audience. Dreams is a flop. We might as well face it. The critics call the turn on it. Well, the great dramatist Anton Chekhov wrote, critics are like horseflies. They sting the horse, but do not help with the plowing. It's not the critics only. Somebody else chloroformed the audience. This is the fifth batch of them, each deader than the other. Give me a drink, Tommy. Do you think you ought to drink during a performance? Don't you start telling me what to do. I'll pay you your back salary next week. And then you'll be free to resign as my advisor and blackmailer. I'll always tell you when I think something's wrong for you. If you never pay me anything. Shut up! The audience can always tell when you're drinking. That was no audience, Mr. Bones. That was a delegation from the morgue, wrapped up in their winding sheets. I could drop dead on that stage, or turn into a swan with two heads, and they'd go right on staring in silence, because the critics told them that was the proper thing to do. <sighs> oh, I'm bushed. Get me that drink. You were marvelous, Marsha. You know, the rain had a dreadful effect on the audience. It always depresses them. And that leading man of yours, well, he's a veritable scarecrow. And a dummy to boot. You can't hear him past the third row. You're carrying the whole show alone, darling, and superbly. You know, I cried like a fool at the end of the second act. You were magic, pure magic, Marsh. Here's to that old black magic. It always comes, that black magic. A funeral hat of fame. You can't miss, and suddenly you can't hit. You're riding hard and fast, and suddenly you're standing still. And those who cheered you and fawned around you unlimber their slingshots and let you have it. And the years are all skyrockets coming down. have anything, George. No, thank you, Marcia. I've done everything I can. Money is very tight. It's impossible to raise a loan without any collateral. Well, I don't see why you keep bothering strangers about it, darling. Loan me the 10,000, George. I'm opening my new play out of town next month, and I'd like to have my debts paid so I can concentrate on my art. Go ahead, you can loan me the 10,000. I haven't got it. I've given you much more. You've given me nothing. You've paid me fees as your lawyer. Nothing. I'm sorry, darling. I can't raise it. Your wife is stuffed with money. Please leave my wife out of these negotiations. I can't understand how I could even pretend to have loved a man with that subway vocabulary. I could kill you. You're Please, a... let's not talk about me. I'm tired of your amateur threats. Your wife is the only interesting thing left about you. I'll ask her over for a financial conference. You'll not do it. Why not? Well, she owes me a great deal. After all, I've improved your haberdashery and your social standing. The profit's all hers. Not to mention turning her gigolo husband into a bona fide lawyer with his name in all the columns. I think any member of the wives' union would say I was entitled to a small loan. I'm not seeing you anymore, Marcia. And I'm warning you. 
Don't try to blackmail my wife or you'll get what you deserve. They exit very quickly now. Mr. Herbert, I, I beg your pardon, but uh, could I talk to you for a moment, sir? I have an appointment, hey, Maurice. Is, this is rather important, sir. What is it? Oh, thank you. Well, I, I don't know how to begin this interview, but I heard the most preposterous rumor. About what, Maurice? About Marsh's play. I heard that you intended to close it in Boston and not bring it into New York. The rumor is a little inaccurate. I am bringing it into New York the last week in September. Ah, I knew it was absurd. Why, it's a beautiful play. It's the very best thing that Marsh has ever done. I'm delighted to put an end to a lot of this idiotic cabal, sir. I'm not bringing it in with Marsha. I don't understand. I'm replacing Marsha in the lead. No. Hazel Bond will open in it in New York in September. Everybody inside. Second act. Huh. Overture. I can't believe what you're telling me. I've given you the facts, Maurice. I have an appointment. Mr. Herbert, Marsha Tillieu is the finest actress in the American theater. She's more than a star. She is an artist such as is seldom born in this world. She's beauty and genius. You're replacing Marsha Tillieu? No, no, that can't be true. I haven't heard right. As well speak of replacing the stars in the heavens and blotting out the rays of the summer moon. Marsha's not what she used to be, Maurice. The last three flops have proved that. They dislike her. There's been too much bad publicity, too many tantrums, too much liquor. And her performance as Madame Pinelli is shoddy and lifeless. That is a lie, sir. Good night, Mr. Tilly. That is a lie. It's a lie, sir. They're destroying my daughter with lies. and then I came back to the theater. Are you ill? I know. Not ill. But the wings are tired. The wings that keep the heart flying. You mustn't pay any attention to these out-of-town critics. The smaller the critic, the bigger his pop gun. The play will be fine it's just as soon as Mr. Herbert whips it into shape. All it needs is a new third act and a new leading man. And in New York, you'll be hailed, my dear. That stuff they wrote this morning is just... just hinterland malice. Do you mind if I make a suggestion, Marsha? Next season, you do something worthy of you. Not these exercises and small talk, these marathons of prattle that they call dramas nowadays, dramas that celebrate the death of language. You will play Shakespeare. Deep calls to deep. Talent to talent. You belong in the magic words of Shakespeare. They're all waiting for you. Juliet, Portia, there's Demona. You'll bring them new luster, new wings. You'll. A little drafty sitting here. 
Would you mind for me your home, my dear? Yes, Marcia's next appearance was in a tragedy. Her own. She lay dead across the bed like Desdemona, two bullets in her heart and around her the signs of murder. Signs that set police and newspapers hunting for a killer. Greetings, Lexley. Veering. Good evening. Is ah. that as much as you can take of this opera? Alfred. Late one? Yes. Oh, the police still seem at sea. Marcia's assassin remains uncollared. But bless them. They have a new clue to his identity, which may be revealed in a later edition. You know, the police questioned me for hours. Half of Broadway has been given to the third degree. Seems that anybody who knew Mr. Liu is a logical suspect as a murderer. I'm told this is the worst play of the season. Can't afford to miss it. It might cheer me up. I don't remember seeing you at the funeral. I was out of town. Oh, okay, I've got it. I'll take care of it. I am Maurice Tidhew, sir. How do you do? Oh, my name is Hain. I'm assistant to the district attorney. Yes, yes, I know. In charge of my daughter's murder investigation. Please sit down. I'll be brief. Nice of you to see me. Very nice for a man so busy hunting a murderer. And you haven't found him. Two weeks of searching and no clue to a killer. And the press flaunting her name day by day, bringing fresh scandal to her memory. You, uh, you said on the phone that you had some particular information for me, Mr. Tillio. Yes. Most particular, Mr. Haynes. You've interviewed them all and found only alibis and innocence. Well, if you have any name or evidence to give me, I'll be glad to check back. I'm inviting you to meet the murderer tomorrow night in my daughter's home. Why wait for tomorrow? If there's any truth in what you're saying, we ought to act at once. I suggest that you tell me. And I... That may seem strange and impractical to you, Mr. Hain. An old character actor with his mind jangling like bells out of tune. Please, I beg you, humor me. They will be there. All of them. All of them when you were well. Too well. I've invited them for dinner, informing them that matters are known not to be revealed. They've all accepted they'll be there. And the murderer will be among them. I will give you the name and the proof of the murder tomorrow night, Mr. A. I'd be late. No taxis in the rain, so I was reduced to walking. And where is our host? Our esteemed host is lurking in the wings, waiting for the house to fill up. Dear me. They're all here, including a few of my minor suspicions. Suppose there's any way of getting a drink around here? You ought to know. Who's that vulture? Mr. George Murray, a barrister. Oh. Huh. After my time. I'd like a drink. Why don't you go and ask a butler or someone? I can't go prowling through a strange house. Oh, stop it. Don't pretend you've never been here before. Oh. 
Hello, Emile. I followed your battle of wits with the police and the press. Ridiculous, questioning me as if I'd slashed my own painting. The killer was probably an art critic. Marcia was very proud of your friendship. She always said if one has Mr. Laxley for a friend, one needs no enemies. Plagiarism from Molnar. What do you suppose the old goat's up to, Laxley? The meaning of this gruesome assemblage is beyond me. What do you think, Alfred? Oh, I don't know. Just a little get-together of Marsha's various campaigns for happiness. Oh, well, the old barnstormer has whipped out all his pictures. That one, I think, is Richelieu. And here, I'm afraid, we have Mr. Tiller, you as a fellow. Looks a little like a Pullman porter. And Hamlet, eh? Did you ever see him on the stage, Laxley? Yes, once in my youth. At the Players Club revival of Macbeth, I had that grim pleasure. Seems to have favored Shakespeare. Yes, he had a natural talent for bad acting, which made him a tireless Shakespearean. That, I presume, is the old Ham's lair. Do you think if we applauded violently, he'd come out? For a bow, at least. I'm slowly perishing of hunger. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to present you an important member of our memorial dinner party, Mr. Thomas Hain, assistant to the district attorney of the city of New York. Ah, policeman. That always adds flavor to a cast of characters. I shall not introduce them by a separate name to you, Mr. Hain, for they all have a name in common. They are the world of success. Critics of the drama, painters, poets, playwrights, producers, legal luminaries. They're charming, though sometimes mysterious wives. They're all here. The Roman candle signs that light up Broadway. Dinner is served. You will find your names at your proper places. Mrs. Herbert? The old Pollywog's putting on quite a show. Yes, very fine rain effect. Thunder, too. A bit old-fashioned, but quite interesting. He looks a little odd. Would be odd if he didn't. <laughs> That's very funny. Thank you. And who is this missing miscreant? That is my guest of honor, sir. Well, well. This place has been reserved for one not entirely unknown to us. Who is it? Marsha Tillyou, who has gone out for the moment to fetch her half. I wish to change my place. Keep your seat, my dear. This is delightful. Mr. Tillyou, bless his old grease paint heart, will turn out the lights and dear Marsha will dance for us with a tambourine. I'm an old actor. With the audience seated and the curtain up, I find it hard to wait. And there's one who bids me speak. Here she's here, smiling at those who loved her. But note, note how she looks with cold eyes at one of us, with accusing eyes at one of us whose heart whimpers and cringes. Be gone, Marsha! Let the earth hide you! You're here tonight for the stern business of engines. To hear a name. A murderer's name! The district attorney asked me to give him the name privately. But I refused. Because you were all her friends. Her honorable friends. And I wished you all present at the sour of onions. Miss Thompson, close the doors. Lock them so he can't escape. Good Thompson. She served my daughter during the days of her greatness. Now serves me. Thank you, Thompson. You may retire. Is this not like a play? 
<laughs> Your faces waiting to hear the name of the murdering villain. I'll be waiting. Each edging from his neighbor. I keep my promise, Mr. Hain. I have the proof. Enough to send that one from this table to the gallows. The man who killed my marshal. Who murdered my marshal. He's looking at me. Oh, the terror in his eyes. His name is... Get a doctor quick, he's stabbed. <laughs> Quiet, nobody leave. What's to tell you? Yeah. Who was it? Stark. Marsha, where are you? Marsha, my bright star. Who attacked you? Who was it? I'm closer. You mustn't escape. Find me your ears. He was. He was. He's dead. <gasps> Whoever killed him is in this room. I want you to all line up against the wall till the police come. Wait. Let's have another light in here. Here's a broken wire. There's no need for the police, Mr. Hain. Off your drawn gun. The mystery is a very simple one. Tell you turned out the lights himself. The switch was right under his foot. And then he stabbed himself. If you'll all be quiet, and Mr. Hain will permit, I'll read you a letter. It's from Marsha. It was mailed the night she was found dead. Alfred, I'm bored, tired, hurt, sick, full of nasty things. I'd stay a while longer, but death seems a little easier than life. What's a little poison, more or less, to one who has swallowed so much? Goodbye. And do you remember the opening night of the Forgotten Lady? It was nice. Marsha. May I have that? That's the truth. She committed suicide. Somebody shot her. There were two bullets in her heart. Maurice put them there. He worshipped her. She was his star. Only stars don't commit suicide. Failures do that. He tried to keep her a star. He arranged a murder scene to give her a proper exit. But all this, inviting us, killing himself, he was mad, a madman. You see, he never thought of Marsha as having killed herself. He saw his lovely Marsha as having been murdered by all of us, murdered by all the unscrupulous and cruel adorers who had danced around her. Including your humble servant. I can only say bravo. The old barnstormer played his own death scene from the moment he came into this room. He planned to, to almost name a name and then die. Unless all of us would be raked over the coals, clapped into jail. Not for his murder alone, but for Marsha's. <laughs> that was the main plot line. What a grand old boy. Dying and remembering his lines to the last. A lovely piece of old-fashioned mummery.
is Ben Hecht speaking. Movie making has calmed down a bit in the last 15 years and Hollywood is almost as sane a town as Keokuk. Well, let's say half as sane, which is an astonishing improvement. Or perhaps it is not an improvement at all. Who knows? Personally, I pine a trifle for the old days when movie making was a mad and wonderful thing, like riding bareback on a unicorn or going after whales with a bean blower. There was the great Poobah, top smash Caesar of the studio, hurler of thunderbolts, molder of destinies, headwaters of all the swimming pools. Grand, gloomy, and peculiar he was, and the earth did tremble at his footfall. And there was a star, famed from pole to pole, beloved by everybody's husband, with the possible exception of her own, pulling down 10,000 a week with no taxes, and unable to stand at all. And finally, there was my hero, the great agent, the 10 percenter, the peddler of genius and beauty, full brother to the headless horseman he was, evasive, double-talking, lying himself into a semi-annual collapse, irresponsible as a grasshopper, and liaison officer between the Mad Hatter and the three little pigs. I give you Orlando Higgins in his terrible prime. What's new, Flanagan? Uh, Mr. Gorwin wants you to call him immediately. What for? Philippe Fedano seems to have gotten drunk again. Who's Philippe Fedano? He's our client. The one you told Mr. Gorwin was going to be greater than Valentino. Oh, that's phony. If Gorwin calls again, tell him I've gone to Palm Springs. He can't locate me. Check? Check. Anything else? Walter Wanger wants a three months option on that novel you don't like, The Moon Dance. <laughs> it's a stinker. And Metro refuses to let Madeline Long get married. She's been calling all morning. She wants you to break her contract. Her neck would be more constructive. There are a few other things. Hello? Who? Just a moment. I'll see if he's here. She's been calling every 10 minutes since yesterday. A Miss Daisy Marcher. Never heard of her. She's an author. She got hold of your private phone number. I have to keep answering. I hate authors. I get sick every time I talk to one of them. They're the worst fatheads in town. Now listen, I'm not remotely interested in unknown authors. Uh, try the Leland Hayward Agency. He's a fellow who jumps for ham sandwiches. And kindly stop calling me up. This can't be Mr. Higgins. It is, Mr. Higgins. Are you sure? Yes, honey, it's about the only thing in the world I am sure of. Now listen. Well, this is Daisy Marcher. I would have called you up sooner, but I've been sick with a fever and I couldn't get up out of bed. Yesterday was my first day up. Is that so? And how do you feel now, Miss Ma Morrow? Oh, I feel all right now, as long as I keep my muffler around my neck. Well, don't pull it too tight, will you? I won't, but I'm getting very impatient to know why you haven't sold my motion picture drama. You had it for two weeks. It's called A Woman of Sin. That'll be about enough, Miss uh, Hoosis. I'm returning your manuscript in the next mail to leave this office. Goodbye. Holy catfish. We down to handling half-wits? Woman of sin. Check on that, will you, Flanagan? We don't want junk like that going out of this office. Mr. Higgins, secretary. I'm in Palm Springs. In just a moment, I'll see if he's here. Are you in for pretty blue? What does that cutthroat want? Put him on. Hello, Freddy boy. How's the world's worst gin rummy player? <laughs> Any time, pigeon. Yeah, Wednesday's fine. Uh -huh, double stakes? Perfect. Yeah. What's that? Who's... Oh, Daisy Marcher. Yeah, what about her? Well, I'm glad to hear that, Freddy. Oh, great girl, Daisy, yeah. Most brilliant writer I've uncovered in years. Yeah, we handle her. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, have her there at three. Will do. Goodbye. Uh, have what you McCuller come in, will you? Miss Wright, please. Empire wants to buy Woman of Sin. Oh, round up that half-wit for me, will you? Daisy Marcher. Yeah, she sounded like a nut over the phone. That's no drawback in a writer. Last week, Jean Fowler reported to work at Metro on a hearse. 
You see, I want a copy of that uh, Sin Woman script by Daisy Hoosis. Oh, yes, A Woman of Sin. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to explain about that, Mr. Higgins. Uh, we made a mistake and sent it out to Empire instead of returning it to the writer. <laughs> the envelopes got mixed up. <laughs> you know, some writers are born under a lucky star. Even their agents can't stop them. You read it, huh? Oh, yes. Stunk, huh? Decidedly. Worse than at Epic We Sold Columbia? Infinitely. Hey. Never mind a copy. We haven't got one. Good. Anything else? No, go back and see if you can make some more mistakes. That's the only way to succeed in Hollywood. I have Miss uh, Birchley at Mr. Cobb's office at three. You mean Daisy Marcher? Yeah. And handle it yourself, will you? You're the only member of my organization whose head isn't on backwards. I've never seen such a pack of ninnies. You have a 12 o'clock appointment with Mr. Sarosnick. Oh, he's always three hours late. I get there plenty of time. I'm gonna play some tennis. Have a swim. Romanoff's for lunch. Keep in touch. Will do. I'm sorry, Miss Flanagan. You have no appointment with Mr. Cobb. I don't wish to see Mr. Cobb. I'm meeting Orlando Higgins. Mr. Higgins is in reception room A. Thank you. I called 50 places myself. Nobody ever heard of Daisy Marcher. The Screenwriters Guild has no record of her. Those fatheads, all they do is keep voting. I told you never to waste time on them. I hired a detective agency to run her down. They're putting three men on it. Mr. Cobb will see you now, Mr. Higgins. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> Preview you had last night. Everybody I talked to is mad about the picture. If that doesn't get the Academy Award, it'll be one of the greatest injustices ever done in this town. My congratulations, J.B. Higgins, you've done a lot of things I haven't approved of, such as selling me a lot of material which was low-grade garbage unworthy of what Empire stands for. The finest pictures made the finest way. A great slogan, J.B. Don't interrupt me. Because I wish to say that I consider you finally redeemed yourself in my eyes by sending me this new story. A woman of shame, eh? It's called A Woman of Sin. I always told you, Mr. Devlin, this man is a complete idiot. All agents are. They ought to be barred from the industry. You're a great man, J.B. Greatest single force in the industry. If you want to bar me, okay, we can begin the barring right now. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Sit down. Evidently, you have no sense of humor, Higgins. Could be. That story, A Woman of Sin, was placed on my desk by mistake. I never read stories. I read this one. Something guided my eyes to it, and I'm grateful to that power. Because otherwise, this story might have slipped by me. Like Gone with the Wind slipped by me. Am I talking too fast? No, J.B. My boy, I consider a woman of sin greater than Gone with the Wind by twice. It is not only a great masterpiece of woman psychology and human soul drama, but one of the greatest pieces of box office entertainment we've ever gotten our hands on. I'm going to put an all-star cast in it. I'm glad you like it, J.B. Like it? I'm crazy about it. It's what this country needs, a great story of animal love. I want this deal closed by tomorrow with three Higgins. And if you try any Orlando Higgins tricks with any other studio, I'll ruin you for life. Uh, there's just one little hitch, J.B. 
Go on. Uh, the writer. What's the matter with her? Uh, she, uh, she wants too much money. How much? Oh, it's preposterous, uh, but I couldn't budge her. How much? Uh, 75,000. Frankly, J.B., I don't think that script is worth it. No script is. You've got a deal. Mr. Devlin, 75,000 is the price we'll pay for a woman of sin. Have the contracts drawn up at once. I consider it the biggest bargain empire has ever made. We'll shake hands on it, Orlando, like old friends. And remember, we got witnesses. Good morning. What's new, Flanagan? The detectives have struck out on Daisy Marsh. Hire some more. They've covered every hotel and hideaway. So don't tell me there is no Daisy Marcher. I talked to her. How are you? In the pink. Mr. Higgins, secretary. Who? Just a moment. I'll see if he's here. Are you in for J.B. Cobb? That fat head. Orlando Higgins. Yes, I'm on personally. Hello, J.B. No, 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 wait a minute. Before you start talking, I've been up half the night talking to Daisy Marcher like a Dutch uncle. I can't get her to see it our way. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Uh, she absolutely refuses to sign any contract that doesn't give her a percentage of the gross. I, t I, 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 I told her it was absolute lunacy, J.B. Look, I'm on your side. You know that. No, I told her she, she was acting like an absolute stinker. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been begging her to do, to go over and talk it out with you, yeah, like with her own father. Now, I told her you're absolutely the fairest man in town. She spit in my eye. Yeah, we both almost lost her. Oh, now, wait a minute, J.B., I can't stick you like that. Look, I'll try my darndest to... I'll try my darndest to get it for the 75 grand we shook hands on. Yeah, I'll tell her. Will do. Call you back. He offers 100 grand. And we'll go higher. You seen my pants anywhere, Flanagan? You. Oh, I didn't even work up a sweat. I don't know what it is about writers. They're either a millstone or a will-o'-the-wisp. You know, I got a theory that marcher creature dropped dead. Mr. Higgins, secretary. No, Mr. Sousnick, Mr. Higgins has not come in from San Francisco. I'm very sorry. Thank you. I'll tell him. Why do you think Daisy March dropped dead? She's drunk. She was drunk as a coot when she called me. And had a cold. Uh, you take a lush like that and give her influenza, they never recover. Hey, Flanagan. Get me the obituary columns for the last three days, will you? I want to look them over. <laughs> to end up in a drunkard's grave with fame and fortune on your doorstep. Real irony. Make a great movie. Hello. I see. Just a moment. Miss Daisy Marcher to see you. No kidding. Where is she? In the reception room with Miss Wright. Have not send her right in. Send her in, please. <clears throat> What's holding her up? I'll check. Where is Miss Marcher? <laughs> Oh, 
What do you want? I'm Miss Daisy Marcher. Well, go and tell your mother to come in, and you wait outside like a good little girl. Can't I get anybody to run the office right? How many secretaries do I need? I have no mother. I'm an orphan. Which one of you is Mr. Orlando Higgins? I am Orlando Higgins. Then please give me my drama back. Are you trying to tell me that you're the author of Woman of Shame? It's called Woman of Sin, and of course I wrote it all alone. You know what happens to little girls who tell lies? Dirty, rotten lies? Anyway, I never like men with red and guys like you. I'm not in the habit of quarreling with babies. Now, what I want to know is, are you actually the author of Woman of Sin, Cross Your Heart, Hope to Die? Hope to die, yes, I am. Yeah, that hair ribbon kills me. Take that off. I won't. It makes me look taller. My mother gave it to me. You said you didn't have a mother. On her deathbed when I was a little girl. You see, father ran away with another woman who afterwards stabbed him to death. And my mother hanged herself because of a broken heart. They cut her down and she lingered for an hour with her neck broken. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, where do you live, little girl? Oh, in the hills. I like the wilderness. Oh, you live in a tree, huh? Like a squirrel? Part of the time. Then I spent some time with my grandmother. She lives in a little hut because she's half Indian. And very old, about 110. Her name's Minnie Tom. Shut up, you loony liar. I'll spank you. You're a nasty, red-eyed monster. And I forbid you to ever speak to me again. No, no, you don't. Come here. Flanagan. Come on, we're taking this brat home and finding out the truth about her. If I have to skin her alive. So that was all a pack of lies about the stabbings, the hangings, and the Indians. Oh, yes, I'm very much alive, Mr. Higgins. <laughs> and uh, you're sure your daughter wrote this script all alone? I, I, I mean, you didn't help her in the hard parts? Oh, she wrote it all alone, her own little bedroom. But the child simply will not learn how to spell. So I've told her what a help it'd be to her in her career. Haven't I, Babykins? <laughs> This is a very interesting kettle of fish. She's an author? Oh, yes. She's been at it since she was three. Writes day and night, never stops. Poor old thing. Sugar deficiency, the doctor told me I should watch out for it. Well, those are all the facts about Millicent. Daisy Marchers are non de plume. Though, I think that Millicent Egelhofer is much more literary sounding. Don't you? Oh, come here, Pip. <coughs> come here, sweetie. Let me fix your hair with the, the gentleman. I'll think you're just a little street Arab. Mother, this is too much your language. Why, baby, can wear your manners. Uh, Flanagan. Take Daisy into the other room. She's just disturbing her mother. Gladly. Thanks so much. Uncontrollable temper. Her father, you know, was like that. He was a minister of the gospel, but his aura was dark purple all the time. I always felt that it was his aura that killed him and not pneumonia at all. Uh, Ms. Egelhofer, <coughs> I want to talk business with you. Empire Studio is willing to pay $125,000 for Woman of Sin. Is this agreeable to you? I don't know. All that money going to Millicent, to my spoiler character. She's so simple and unassuming now. No, the money will not go to her. The money will go to you. She's a minor. It'd be criminal to hand over the money to a crack-brained infant like that. Poor babykin. I could do so much for her. After all, she does need an older head. Done and done. Now listen hard. This is important. Empire is going to spend three million dollars on this epic. Maybe more before they're through. They're going to advertise it as the most sophisticated love drama ever filmed. Oh, that's wonderful. <sighs> I'm very proud. Now, uh, uh, please, madam, you've got to concentrate. Now, if it's ever found out 
that this great epic was written by a child of nine. It will ruin not only empire, but it'll give the whole industry a black eye. Oh, boy. I, I know the public's very fickle. <laughs> yes, now, in, <clears throat> in putting this deal over for you, Mrs. Egelhofer, I'm taking a terrific gamble. If Empire ever finds out about her, I'd be lynched. No, no, I mean it. J.B. Cobb would have me lynched. Now, the only way to prevent this sort of thing from happening is to have Daisy put in my charge. I'll provide a fine home for her and keep her locked in it. You can visit her any time you want. Hey, you come on, come on, help, please, hurry up! Don't you want to say goodbye to your mother, Daisy? Oh, it doesn't matter. I spoil my child with too much love. No, Mother. You have not spoiled me. It is the world that has spoiled me. You are not to blame. I forgive you and will always love you with what is left of me. Oh, come on, will you? Oh, What do you think, Mrs. Weitzer? Do you wait for Mr. Cobb? Or let's make the picture. We lost already all the money. No, no, no. We'll wait for Mr. Cobb. He'll be here right away. Mr. Cobb is coming. Oh, good, good, good. Hit the bell. Quiet. Quiet. Good morning, Mr. Schweitzer. Uh, this is quite an honor, Mr. Cobb. I've never been on the set before. It's my policy never to interfere. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Schweitzer? Oh, thank you, thank you. No, no, gentlemen. I prefer to stand. Everything's ready, J.B., for the launching ceremony. Well, we can't proceed until Miss Marcher arrives. I'm doing it for her. Hello, J.B. Oh, good morning. Miss Marcher with you? Oh, I'm uh, sorry, J.B. I gave her that case of champagne you sent her. Well, it softened her up for a minute and then bang, right back into her shell. Well, you know how writers are. You can't reason with them. It's like talking to lunatics. Well, that's ridiculous. After all the publicity the studio's given her, like she was George Bernard Shaw. I understand her, boys. She's the kind of a writer unspoiled by Hollywood. Simple, aloof, devoted to her art. Better stay that way. The press is here, Mr. Cobb, waiting. Thank you, Mr. Schweitzer. This is your big opportunity. I won't forget you, Bill. Pardon me. Over here, Chief. Ladies and gentlemen of the press and fellow workers. I have only a few words to say on this important occasion. We are starting our picture, A Woman of Sin. And in starting this picture, I am fulfilling a dream I've had for 25 years of someday giving to the world a cinema masterpiece that will prove once and for all that Hollywood has come of age as a center of art. A Woman of Sin is such a masterpiece. I wish to salute all the great stars who are going to take part in it and all of the talents that will contribute to its creation, but above all, the brilliant dramatist who has given us this throbbing story of love, Miss Daisy Marcher. Well, on with the show, ladies and gentlemen, and remember, through all the happy days of toil before you, as Shakespeare said, the play's the thing. Thank you. Uh, all right, Alfred, on with the show. Uh -huh. Places, everybody. Quiet off stage. Places. Camera. Action. I have found out at last what you are, Millicent. And what am I, Gilbert? Cruel, selfish, a woman of sin. And are you leaving me, Gilbert? No, no, I forgive you. I love you with what's left of me. I love you with my grief, 
my broken heart, my scalding tears. Oh. My darling. Cut! Print! Sensational! What's new, Flanagan? Walter Wayne, do you want to see you at midnight, projection room B? Yeah. The Paramount meeting is for five o'clock. Mm-hmm. Mr. Southnick wants to know if you're free to go fishing tomorrow. No. The rest are from actors and writers. How's our little balls there? She's sticking a chocolate cake. think? I'd still say she was about nine. Yeah, but not a young nine. Go away. Flanagan's gonna take you to her house with her tonight. Oh, Flanny, how do you spell blind? B-L-O-O-D. Sure it's with two O's? Yes, I'm sure. Talk to you, Orlando. Oh, well, all right. Let's uh, let's sit down over here and have a good old conference. Orlando. Hmm? I'm sick and tired reading about a woman of sin in the newspapers. I'd like them to write about a sea of blood. Is that so? What in blazes is a sea of blood? No. I've told you a hundred times mm -hmm. already. It's the new screen drama I'm writing about those pirates. And it's a hundred times better than a woman of sin. Just a moment. There's a Mr. Moriarty to see Miss Daisy Marcher. Goody! No, but no, quiet. No, Goody! you lunatic. Don't, I, the please, captain, I told you not. Who oh, is Moriarty? Oh, Send Mr. Moriarty in, please. Where is he? Hi. Hi. Are you Moriarty? Yeah. Well, come on in. What's your first name? They call me Captain. He's Captain Moriarty. That's right. I got your letter, Daisy. I come over to your mother and she told me to come here. Ah, oh, and how is Daisy's mother? Eaten. Come on in here. We're going to work in here. And you can bring your boat, too. There's plenty of room in the sea. I can only stay here one hour, but I'll come back and bring my boat. Oh, goody, goody! Come on, Captain. Kind of cute, huh? Hello. Yes? Just a moment, please. Mr. Cobb's office on the phone. They're running a rough cut of a woman of sin tonight. Eight o'clock sharp, projection room B. They want to know if you'll be there. Oh, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yes, he'll be there. No use putting on any false modesty, J.B. You've got a sensation in woman of sin. I cried through the last five reels like a baby. Why, it's a combination of Anna Karenina, Camille, and the birth of a nation. It can't miss. Miss? It's good for a seven to ten million gross. Frankly, J.B., I didn't think you had a movie like this in you. You surpassed yourself. I had Bill Schweitzer in and had a serious talk with him, J.B. I got him to see the point and he's agreed to take his name off the picture as producer. It's going to read... Personally produced by Jerome B. Cobb. I didn't really expect that, boys. 
But it's wonderful to know that you're appreciated by your fellow workers. After all, you had the vision, J.B. And that opening talk you made on the set. I could have made the picture myself after a speech like that. Excuse me, gentlemen. Yes? It's the art department. Send them in. Forgive my not sharing your enthusiasm, boys, but when a thing is done, you feel kind of let down, hollowed out. You know Vincent Brown, J.B.? You think my head is in the clouds so much I don't know my own art department? I've been hearing fine things about you, Mr. Brown. But this is a sort of a red-letter day in my life, Mr. Cobb. I've worked here 12 years, and this is the first time I've had the honor of meeting you. Thank you. May I introduce my assistant, a very fine, loyal man? Mr. Cobb's time is valuable, Hadley. Uh, proceed ahead. Yes, uh, let me see what you gentlemen have to show me. Who's that fellow you brought with you? He's the artist. His name's Danello. He drew all the layouts. What's the idea of bringing him along? You know how J.B. feels about artists. Don't worry, he won't get in the way. Uh, would you mind sitting there on that couch, please? I'll call you if I need you, Danny. These are just the preliminary sketches, Mr. Cobb. I thought you might have some ideas which I could incorporate. I understand. Mr. Brown, you've done a fine thing here. Well, after all, Mr. Cobb, I had your work to inspire me. Are these for the magazines or the billboards? We'll Mr. take that up later. Uh, let me see what else. Of course. Sensational. Uh, would you mind a very small suggestion? Why, not at all, Mr. Cobb. That's what we're here for. I would like I Love You changed. Uh, that line is 25 years old. Yes, certainly. We'll hit that harder. Anything else, Mr. Cobb? Not a thing. I'm extremely pleased with everything. I think we ought to flood the country with this stuff, nationally. This picture is going to outgrow has gone with the wind. I feel it. That's not what I've been working for, Mr. Devlin. A woman of sin is going to win every Academy Award Oscar. I think this time, I've earned them. This gentleman is art. Good morning. Shut up! You big know-it-all. Something wrong? Never make a mistake. Flanagan, the guardian angel. You certainly sunk the Mauritania this time with everybody on board. Fine work. Do you mind telling me what I'm supposed to have done? You mailed a copy of the Sea of Blood to Jerome Cobb, personally. With Daisy Marcher's name on the outside of the envelope, so he'd be sure and grab it and read it himself. His favorite writer. Oh, my Aunt Bessie. I it's... did not mail that script out. You were supposed to watch her! I have watched her like a hawk every minute of the day. I am cross-eyed from watching her. Well, it was mailed, I tell you. Oh. Ever since I read that pirate hogwash, I've been worried something like this had happened. A hundred duels to the death on the first 20 pages. Fifteen women get their heads cut off, including five harmless old ladies. And the hero, single-handed, captures a whole fleet of ships. Stabs to death 75 sailors in a battle all alone. And for a finish, they hang the whole town. Two thousand men, women, and children all get hanged. Then they set fire to them for no reason. Didn't Mr. Cobb like the script? He's been chasing... Chasing me all over the map. Caught me at the beach club. I told him it was a practical joke. Some sore-head writer trying to undermine Miss Marcher. You crippled the idiot. Shame on you. Writing a lot of filthy junk like the sea of blood. How dare you talk to me! You little fat... Let me go, you don't me! Let me go, you bad man! Go on, cry. I ought to wring your neck. Why didn't you stick to sex? 
But you have to show what an idiot ignoramus you are by writing about a lot of pi Get that miserable junk out of here. You little sneak. You did it. You sent that script down. You've killed him. Shut up or I will. Now come clean, you little tub of guts. You sent it out, didn't you? Now you give me that original. And you give me the original of Woman and Sinner, I'll break your little neck. I'll break your neck, you. You can't have them. I've got them both. Nobody can have them. Stand back or I'll kill you. Surround him, Captain. I'll break your neck, you. What are you running here, a madhouse? What's the idea of beating up children this time of day? Uh, oh, <laughs> these are these are my sister's kids. Just raising the dickens. <laughs> It's all right, gentlemen. Come on in, J.B. I came over here because I personally want to track down the dirty crook who wrote this rotten thing. See him, you blood. Give me that get, right get away from me, little girl. Get these children home in one second, will you? Get away from me. Where are your manners, little girl? Like get rid of these brats, will you? I want to talk to you, Paula Chief. Let him stay. No, don't be a stinker, Fred. Just a minute. Just a minute. Little girl. What's your name, little girl? Daisy Marcher, and I want my story back from this big, fat fool. What do you mean, your name is Daisy Marcher? Where's your, your, your mother? Oh, hang my mother. What does she say? Little girl, did you really write The Sea of Blood? Yes, I did. I did so, absolutely. I helped her. I got a golden on my mom's wedding. Nobody leaves this joint. Can you prove that you wrote this story, little girl? What are you asking her questions for? You heard what she was saying when we came in. She's got the original copy. The one we've got is only a carbon. I noticed it when I was reading it. Yeah, I heard her. But I also heard her say she had the original copy of something else. Okay, if you just let me handle this, fellas, everything will be okay. You don't my word on it. This man is trying to put something over. Something so dirty and cheap, I refuse to believe it. I refuse to believe any human being could sink so low as this man. Hold it, Chief. Is there any other Daisy Marcher besides you? No, there is not. Don't be silly. I'm the only one. Oh. <laughs> Go on, Freddy. Ask her and get it over with. Little girl, have you ever written any other screenplay than this one? You must be crazy. Really crazy, I should say I did. I wrote A Woman of Sin. It's been in all the papers every day. And on the billboards, too, with my name. That's the silliest question I ever heard. Yes. <laughs> Is that true? Listen, will you? You come barging in here like a pack of hoodlums, spilling the beans. I've been trying to protect you fellas from the beginning. Oh. Get Mr. Cobb a glass of water. Never mind me. Empire, the industry, the studio. I want a straight answer. You got it. There lies the author of Woman of Sin in all her glory. You scum. You grave robber. Taking advantage of my friends. Nobody took advantage of you. You took advantage of yourself like you always do. Shut up. You've ruined me for what? Tell me that. Using a dirty child to make a dirty penny. No, 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 I can't believe it. She never wrote that. That idiot child never wrote that epic. Never. Mike, call the police. Get me the FBI. You rotten man calling me names. I'll finish you off. Whoa, whoa. Hey, just a minute. Plenty of J.B. Plenty of all right. Give me a hand. Hold all calls, please. <laughs> I don't see what you're so excited about, J.B. You got a great picture. You built up a great name. Have a heart, Flanny. Let me in there. 
There's no reason in the world why you shouldn't cash in on that. I'm sure Daisy Marcher will play ball, keep this whole thing undercover. After all, she's a pretty smart kid. I'm sure we're all agreed on that. Look, you keep her quiet, you got no problems. Five pictures, one a year by Daisy Marcher. Oh, with a couple of rewrites, that bucket of blood will be a knockout. I'll make a deal with you right here and now. $125,000 a picture, and a clause included. The first squawk out of Daisy Marcher or anybody else about her being a little young, you cancel the whole thing out. What do you say, J.B.? Got to fight on. See my legal department tomorrow. Draw up the contract. Will do. Can't give up the ship. George Fisher speaking to you from the forecourt of Gorman's Chinese Theater here in the heart of Hollywood. The event, a world premiere of a great motion picture, Woman of Sin. Tonight here at Gorman's Chinese Theater are thousands of fans lining the streets across the street from the theater and the fans in the bleachers on both sides of the lobby of the theater. Cordons of police are holding back the crowd. Now listen, you're going to keep your big trap shut. You understand? Yeah. I tell you, we're taking a terrible chance bringing her to the premiere. This town is full of snoops. Wouldn't you like to stay in the candy store like I suggested? No. But she'll be OK, JB. I guarantee it. There's no chance of a slip up. Whatever happens, we're protected. I got a right to see my own picture, haven't I? Now listen, one squawk out of you, and you lose that whole five picture deal. Is that clear? Yeah. And you don't go hunting lions in Africa with Moriarty. Yeah. And you don't go to India. Yeah. What does she want to go to India for? Research. You give me your sacred promise that you'll play ball all the way down the line? Will do. Good. And now coming into the theater, some of the greatest movie makers of them all. Walter Wager, David O. Selznick, Samuel Goldwyn, Jack Warner, and there's L.B. Mayer, ladies and gentlemen. And now the greatest of them all, Mr. Jerome B. Cobb and his entourage, including Orlando Higgins. I'm sorry, folks, but there's no babies allowed at this opening. I'm J.B. Cobb. This infant is uh, with the party. Certainly, Mr. Cobb. Who likes? Who a lot of people, Daddy? Is everybody going to the movie show, Daddy? Shut up. Uh, are they all going to the beautiful picture, Daddy? Don't overact. 